Well, welcome. Welcome to Faith Bible Church Online. We sure are glad that you chose to worship with us. I know that uh, this isn't uh, the easiest way to worship, but we sure are thankful for the opportunity and the way that we have uh, to worship this way. Um, before we get started and before we get going this morning's message, I, I do want to to uh, uh, acknowledge Memorial Day coming up and our veterans, those who have sacrificed ultimately for our country. I just want to say thank you, that we appreciate uh, them. We appreciate the families that have lost loved ones. Uh, we do thank, thank you for that sacrifice, for that uh, commitment, for, for the submission, submission that it took to to follow the orders that uh, that ended to be um, these things. And so we do appreciate and honor uh, our veterans or those who have lost their, those who have uh, sacrificed for our country. But I do want to say that also a, a, a thank you for those who are veterans, those who have uh, served for our country and served so faithfully. I would like to be in a congregation where we could acknowledge you and tell you thank you for fighting for our country. Yes, we realize you did not um, uh, sacrifice in the same way, but we appreciate the commitment, appreciate the, the, the desire to want to serve our country, the, the, the commitment that was the same as those that, that lost their lives. And thank you for that. And, and I also want to have a special thank you for those who are currently involved in our military, and that's only one that I know of, and that's Reuben, and, and we do appreciate you, Reuben, for serving in the military as he's part of our National Guard, and, and, and we do thank you for your service, and thank you for, for defending our rights as a country, and we thank your family uh, for allowing you to do that, and, and I just want to say this one thing with regard to, to Reuben. At some point, he's going to have to be deployed in, in, in uh, gone for a while just because of um, what, what, what he does. And, and I think it would be good for us as a congregation to, to support the family, to, to support Estella, to make sure that uh, we have her back, that she knows that she's not alone, that as a church that we're there for, that maybe we can provide meals, not that she uh, can't um, provide meals to her, her own, but just so she she knows our love, our support, um, and just being behind her. So uh, I want to say that. Well, moving into announcements, there's really only one announcement before we get to the message this morning, and that is the announcement of the <laughs> the ball that is rolling, proverbially speaking. Um, no churches aren't open. No, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. I don't know when they're going to be opened. Uh, but yes, I see the signs as much as you do. Um, last Friday, uh, President Trump did, uh, did come out and say that churches should be open and that if, if the governors don't do that, he will stand in and open them. Um, and, and so we saw that. And then right after he did that, just an hour or so afterwards, we saw that the CDC released uh, documentation on how churches were to uh, look, how they were to act. I mean, not a mandate, but suggestions. So we appreciate that. And then not just a few hours or so after that, we saw uh, Governor Newsom uh, come out and say that before Monday, he will have his guidelines and regulations of what it'll look like for churches to reopen. And then he said uh, the statement that he is, is anxious, he's, he's ready, he wants the church to open. So that's all we know right now. Uh, I'm sitting here at Saturday morning at, uh, at 1045, so you're obviously listening at a different time, and uh, hopefully Sunday. And uh, so you might know something I don't know, but that's all the information I have at this point. And uh, information is going to be changing quickly, uh, and we will let you know as soon as we know anything. Uh, when the church is open, and, and they will open soon, uh, we will let you know. Will it be next Sunday, the Sunday after that, Sunday after that? We don't know. 
but uh, it's imminent. It will happen soon, and we're thankful for that. And, and just an encouraging thought on that. Finish well. Be content with what the governor has has for us. Uh, submit our 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 control, our authority uh, to his authority, and and enjoy the process. Uh, part of submitting is doing it willfully, and, and so let's don't short circuit this, and let's don't. Uh, cancel out what God's doing by getting angry or upset or not having the right attitude. To submit is means to do it willfully, to do it joyfully, to do it acceptingly. Not that we're saying it's right, and we're not saying it's right, but saying that he has the authority given by God to make that decision. And I know there's a lot of questions out there. People say, no, he doesn't because we've been uh, mandated by God to open church to me to worship. So God's word overruns. No, not in this context. This context, it's still we need to follow the governor. And uh, so let's do that. Let's finish well. Let's get on the other side and just enjoy what God what God has done in our lives in tra in transformation to obedience to His word. Exciting, I think. I think it is. Well, at this point, no other announcements that I'm aware of. Um, we're excited about reopening and reopening legally. Uh, so we'll, we'll all pray for that and pray uh, fervently for that. I, I believe God has heard, God is listening, and uh, we just want his will to be done. So at this point, let's uh, go, to the, go to the Lord in prayer, ask him to bless the service, and we will... Uh, look into what 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6 has to say this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we're humbled by the fact, Lord, that, that we, we see your hand in all of this. We were starting to question, we were starting to try to control, starting to try to make things happen because we didn't see your will as clearly as maybe we could have. And there was anxiety, and there was trouble, and, and, and um, it wasn't peace. Father, thank you for the way that you've worked in this. Help us trust in you and, and not our own flesh. And Father, I pray that you help us as we're dealing with this passage in, 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 um, in Peter. Father, I, I pray that you help us truly see that Submission, women's submission, submitting to their husband is not a bad thing. It's not a demeaning thing. It's actually an exalting thing. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this morning as we continue on in 1 Peter 3, we're going to be looking at submission. And I want you to know... Top of my head, this has been the passage I have saw from the very first day that I chose to preach this book. It's the passage I've been anxious about, the passage I had, I had worried about the timing of, the passage that I somewhat dreaded preaching until I got to study it more. It's not that I haven't studied this passage, um, I just haven't gotten out of it what I got out of it this week. So thank you for the opportunity that you give me to be your pastor, which allows me the time to study Scripture. And I wouldn't have come up with this if I hadn't have spent the time to study. But this passage of, of submission is not a demeaning passage at all. And if we feel it's demeaning, it's because we're not thinking the way Christ thinks. We're not thinking biblically in our mind. But to think biblically is really to see submission as the, the, the wife submitting to her husband as an exalted position. Actually, I, I, I hope that I'm going to be able to communicate today that this passage, if nothing else, is exalting women 
as an example of how we all should live our lives with regard to authority. And I believe that is the case. And as we have always looked at this as a demeaning passage, I think we're wrong. I think we really missed the point. I don't think that's the way God sees it at all. I think God sees it different. So let's get in the passage and see, see what you think as we, um, as we understand it a little bit better. The way that God sees beauty is obviously different than the way the world sees beauty. The title of the message where we're going to be looking at is A Beautiful Woman. The way that, that the world sees beauty is totally external. It's sensual, it's external, and, and, and they, they have such a small um, uh, deviate, deviation of what beauty is that not very many people in the world actually fit that criteria. Actually, from the world's standpoint of beauty, there are only a handful of pe people that are beautiful from their standpoint. And this is something that is that is accepted, even though it's it's so ridiculous, it is accepted by the entire world. It's accepted by women, it's accepted by little girls, it's something that causes emotional issues, it's something that causes fears, anxieties, all kinds of things that happen, uh, fears because women are trying to feel loved, accepted, beautiful in the world's eyes. It, it even causes them to make bad decisions like eating disorders, dating non-believers, wearing immodest clothes, etc., 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 and all for the purpose of trying to feel loved, to trying to feel appreciated, trying to feel beautiful and accepted by the world. Well, I've got some good news. That's not the way God sees you. That's not the way God sees us. We're going to see this morning that God sees beauty from an internal standpoint. God does not see beauty externally in the way that we think so. And, and to think about the way the world sees external beauty, that their person that they put up on a pedestal as the most beautiful person in the world, could be the very person that would wreck a marriage, right? Be contentious and, and argumentative and divisive and all of these things. But that person that they call beautiful is not beautiful, not necessarily. What God is looked at, looking at is something totally different. What God is calling beautiful is the desires and intention of the heart. And since a woman has put their trust in Christ, if you have put your trust in Christ, in God's eyes, I want you to know right now, you are beautiful. In God's eyes, you are gorgeous. Now, hopefully in your, your husband's eyes, you're beautiful. But in God's eyes, you're beautiful because you have the beauty of God within you. But you're also beautiful by the way that you act. Um, I wish I had an, an illustration of a woman. <laughs> I don't. I have an illustration of a man. It's a little awkward. And this man is not beautiful externally. He's ugly. I, he's dead, so I can say that. But his name's R.C. Chapman. The only picture of him I've seen is, is less than attractive. Um, but yeah, probably the most beautiful person, and I've never met him, but I've ever read about other than Christ and, and our apostles. And this was a man that just looked at life differently, looked at people differently. He, he allowed himself to be abused, to take advantage of. He, he literally submitted himself to everyone. And that was attractive. It was so attractive that the whole town knew of this man. And not just the entire town, but the, but the non-believers the scallywags, the deviants, the, the most um, derelict of all the people, they all knew this man, and not just knew him, but respected him and esteemed him highly. Everyone did. Why is that? Because he was truly really beautiful. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about an internal beauty. We're talking specifically about submission, obviously, 
That wasn't his role. But submission, what we're going to learn today, submission is not just something, a box that we're to check to be obedient to God. Submission is a foundational principle of how we are to love people. As if we can't submit, then we can't love God, and we cannot love other people. And I'll get into that in a minute, and, and hopefully that's understandable. And I just want to really elevate women, not because it's my desire, but because that's the way I see this passage. My daughter's in the, my wife, my daughter, and my girl dog. I guess that doesn't matter, or in the audience. And I want my, my wife and my daughter to be elevated in my daughter especially, to, to esteem uh, the position of, of a submissive wife, not as something that is demeaning, but something that is powerful, as powerful. We're going to get into that in a minute. We're going to look at three explanations of true beauty. Three explanations of true, be of true beauty is seen in 1 Peter 3. Six And at this time, we're going to read the passage. So if you would like to stand for the reading of God's Word, um, that would be great. And the reason we do that is not out of tradition, but out of respect to God's Word. There are some traditions that are good, and this is one of them. 1 Peter 3, 1-6. through 6. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they might be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding of hair, the wearing of jewelry, or putting on addresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable qualities of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious. The sight of God. For this is the way in the former times the, the holy women also hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. First point we're going to see this morning, is beauty is seen through submission. Beauty is seen through submission. Well, one of these days I'll get my notes right. Excuse me. There we go. In the 60s, women's rights came to the forefront. And a lot of what happened in the 60s, the Bible agrees with, and I agree with, and we can all agree with. In the 60s, they came up with um, women's equal rights to vote. Certainly, that should be true. We're glad that that happened. They came up in the 60s with equal rights, equal pay for women. Certainly. We agree with that, and we, we think that's true, and we're glad for it. They came up with equality in the workplace. Now, they took that a little further than, than, uh, than it stated here, but in, in essence, we agree with that. Equality in the workplace, yes, women should be treated equal in the workplace. But then from there, it skewed quickly. It, one of the things they, they said was that women were to never be let themselves be told what to do, never submit. And, and, and that became a huge issue. Don't humble, don't uh, demean yourself by letting someone have control over you and let them put their evil control over you as a person. You need to rise up and dominate and show your independence. Well, that sounds great. It's just not very Christ-like behavior. And it's not something that Christ did as well when he walked on this earth. And as we see this passage, we see that, that what he's saying is that 
is that we are to see ourselves exactly the opposite. In, in the, the context of the passage, is really going back to uh, verse uh, 2 of, of chapter 2. We start off the passage and he says, in the same way, you wives. And what he's doing is he's referring back to the context. Going back to context verse even 11, saying that we should abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. And then he talks about in verse 12 how we're to, to live our lives in a way around the non-believers that we're beautiful. You see the correlation between what he's talking about, the inward beauty, and in this verse in verse 12, or verse 12 of chapter 2. Then he goes into verse 13, and then to verse 18, and talks about how we are to submit uh, to to uh, all authorities. And then verse 18, that we're submit to our boss. And then he goes on in, the, in verse 20 and so, and talks about how Christ submitted. So that's the context. The context is submission. So I, I want to to bring out that I think this is a bookend to that context. That that he's not it's not an afterthought. He's not saying, oh yeah, in pushing women down. He's actually raising women up and saying, look, this is the example of how we're to do this. All of this teaching, verse 11, verse 13, verse 18, example of Christ, is now being typified, is now being showed, now being given the example in how women are to submit. And guys, we can't love anybody without submitting. And so instead of saying that this is an issue of, of suppressing, demeaning women. This is really an issue of elevating. And I want you to see it that way. Women, I want you to see it that way. But men, I want you to see it that way as well. To enjoy um, the submissive woman is not she's submitting to you because you have any, <laughs> anything good, but you're sub she's submitting to God because of her godliness. What a beautiful thing. We go on and... and get deeper into the passage, and he says, in the same way, wives, be submissive to your own husband. Now, what's going on there is, is, is he's really laying out the finishing up uh, explanation of what submission is, and submission has to do with authority. Uh, what he's saying there, and what's not being said, is that God has made uh, the husband, the authority of the house. And we, we see that in other passages. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head over every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head, God is the head of Christ. And so we understand that there is a subordination in authority uh, in heaven, that's the way. That's the way God has established order, and is the way He has created order in the family. There is a headship. There is somebody that's in charge. It makes sense too. I mean, how can you say two people are in charge? They're going to butt heads, and there's going to be problems. That's the world's problem with saying we're all equal. No, there needs to be one person in charge, and that's what submission is. So let me explain a little bit about what submission is. I know we've talked a lot about it, but uh, let me uh, explain it a little bit better just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, well, let's, let's read Matthew 26, verse 39 as well. So we see that Jesus submitted. Uh, listen to this. My Father, if it is possible, let, uh, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. It's interesting, isn't it? So God, uh, God the Son submitted to God the Father. And so we see that, and that's important. But what is submission? Just to make sure we're on the same page, there's so many misconceptions of what submission is. A submission is not being the quiet uh, woman that doesn't speak up or say anything, just sits and knows her place. That is not submission. That's wrong. That's unbiblical. What submission is, is that women, please get involved in decisions. You should be involved in your decisions. If you're not being involved in your decisions, that's unbiblical. If you're too afraid 
or you're too uh, afraid of the consequences. That's unbiblical. Get involved. Get involved in decisions. Make sure you're being heard. Make sure he knows uh, your opinion because the two of you is what God has given to make the wisdom of the family. And, 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 and so you need to be involved. You need to be uh, um, uh, um, communicate uh, your opinion. But the issue is when he makes a decision, what do you do? And see, it's easier if you're not involved, right? If you're not involved in the decision, if you don't care, if you don't get involved, he makes another decision and you just go, whatever, he's just a stupid man and he's going to do stupid things, right? So it's easy and that is unbiblical. But yet it's hard when we get involved, we give our two cents, we give our opinion. It's hard in, as employers and it's hard in the government as well. That's why we're struggling where we're at in the church right now, because it's hard to listen to Gavin Newsom when we don't agree. But we need to submit. And there's, a, there's, there's wisdom, there's love, there's, there's, there's a biblical holiness that, that, that we need in learning how to submit. And, and that is what a woman does to their husband, even though he might be an idiot, and we are sometimes, in making bad decisions, you submit to that. And what submission means is you say, okay, I have given you my opinion, and this is my opinion, and now if you're going to do something different, I fully respect you. I fully accept that. I'm fully behind that, and I'm not going to tell the kids, yes, do this because your dad is making me do it. No, that is not submission. Submission is to say, your father and I want you to do this. Even though it's not your decision, it is what he agreed upon, and that's what submission is, to be willful and be exciting because you know that God is going to sovereignly work in that situation. It's not you controlling this. It's God controlling it. So you can let go. You can, you can let, and, and then you learn to flex your trust muscles that God is going to do things. It's hard, and it's not something for the faint heart. That's why I say this is really uh, exalting women to a high position is showing men how we should live our lives, learning how to submit to everyone by the way our women of our wives submit to us. So I think it's a beautiful thing. Then he goes on. He says, in the same way, wives, be submissive to your own husband, as uh, so that if any of them are obedient to the word, they might be one, or uh, they might be one without any words. What? What does that mean that they might be one without any words? He, he first talks about it. He says, look, if, if there's any who are, any of them who are disobedient to the word, and that, that, uh, that statement there in the Greek, if there are any, that's called a first class condition. Actually, in the Greek, it's saying, since there are some. Since there are some of you who have husbands that are disobedient to the word, or disobedient there is, uh, is actually means non-believer. It's a, 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 a pethomai, a, a petho, and a petho ah in front of any word in the Greek just means the opposite or the negative of that. Petho means convinced or persuaded. So it's just saying if there's anyone uh, that is married to a person that is not convinced or persuaded, meaning they're non-believer. Say, so, well, how could this be the case? How could a believer marry a non-believer? Is that okay? No, this is first-generation churches. So these are people that were already married uh, to people. They didn't know Christ. Uh, so obviously everybody was non-believers. And then they came to Christ, and their husband hasn't come yet. So, so this is not second generation. This is not somebody who, who would have married a non-believer. Uh, that is not something the Bible agrees with. It's not something that is, that is going to be helpful for you. And it really is, if you marry a non-believer, it's kind of more indicting about you than anything else, how you would be attractive to something that's not godly. So that's just more about you and your relationship with God than anything else. But he says, so if, so even if you have any of them that are disobedient to the word, uh, then he says, 
they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chase in respectful behavior. How in the world does that mean? How can somebody come to Christ without the gospel? Is that possible? No, not possible. They have to hear the gospel. So what's his point? His point is that so many women are trying to change their husbands and do everything they can to change them, and the best thing they can do is live a life in a way that, that exemplifies Christ in them. And the best way they can do that is by submitting. And when you submit, you look like, this is what he's saying, you look chase, and not just chase, but also respectful. So it looks like a person who is, <clears throat> who is chaste and respectful. And just to let you know, uh, one of the number one things a man is looking for is respect. And that's something he appreciates. But the chaste and the respectfulness is not a separate quality. It is a quality that happens after you submit. Listen to this. When chaste, the word chaste just means pure, means undefiled. Uh, when, when you are not submitting, you are not pure, right? You're not undefiled. You are trying to compete with that other person about who's in charge. That's what we see in Genesis 3.16. That's the whole issue there, is that the woman is trying to usurp the authority of man, and the man wants to crush her in return. This is a battle that just keeps going and going. It's like climbing the ladder, right? It just keeps going and going. And going, and that's exactly uh, what's happening, what happens in every marriage until you submit. You lay that aside. There's no contention anymore. Right? There's no battle. There's no fighting. That You're saying, hey, I, I appreciate that you're leadership. That's the way God's made you. I respect that. God did it perfectly, and, and, and I'm actually excited about that. Because when I honor you, I'm honoring God. That's a huge thing. I mean, this is something that, that, that is very practical for women's spiritual growth. And so when you submit, do you see how that it causes you to be chaste? It causes you to be pure at heart. And it causes you to respect your husband. Because you respect the position God placed him in. And it is a hard position. Uh, the grass is always greener on the other side, as you say, and, and you know, it's easy to be, um, to, to be the one in charge. But I remember, so it was yesterday, when Tamara and I got married, we went on a, a honeymoon to, to Cancun, and we just got to the motel room, and she got a migraine. And, and I, I'm, you know... 20-something years old, she's, you know, younger than me, and I didn't know what to do. We're in Mexico. I speak the same language, and there was a panic that went through my body. I realized I am now in charge of this lady. I'm, I am, I'm responsible for her. I've got to make sure she's okay, and there's a heavy load with regard to that. But uh, nonetheless, um, God has made women beautiful. In, in the beauty is not your external looks. The beauty is, number one, found in your position. Your beauty is found in learning how to submit to your husband, how to die to your own desires that you have, as, as Christ died, we go into the waters of baptism, we die to those desires, and we come up a new person living for Christ and not for ourselves. We need to die to those desires and submit so that we might live for Christ, not for ourselves. Number two, what we're going to look at, first one is that Beauty is seen through submission. Second point, we see as beauty is found in the heart. 
Beauty is found in the heart, gentle and quiet spirit. Now, as Peter is dealing with submission, and he explains submission, and he explains what it is, and he goes through a lot of detail, now he transitions to explain that, that look, some, the, the reason that submission is important are, are when you submit, that is the thing that's making you beautiful because true beauty is found internally, not externally. Look, you can find someone that's externally beautiful. In 20 years, they're not going to be, right? And you can find somebody that is externally beautiful, and that doesn't guarantee and usually guarantees the opposite, that they're not going to be the nicest person. They're not going to be somebody you want to be married to. But God is saying that beauty is the person you want to be married to is the person that has a changed heart, a person that has that is that is looking through the eyes of the gospel in Christ and not through the eyes of their own self. Second passage starts out with your adornment must not merely be external, braiding of hair, wearing of gold, and putting on addresses. And before we get any further, let's just kind of explain this, what's happening. This is another passage that's, that's been misunderstood. Is this passage saying that women are not to braid their hair, women are not to put on gold, women are not to wear, and the word for dresses is actually fancy clothes. Is that what it's saying? No, it's not saying that at all. Let's, if we go into the word order, the Greek, we'll see that, that that's not its point at all. Actually, the word order says it differently. It says, uh, puts things backwards in word order. And the reason it does that, understand in Greek, word order is emphasis, is emphasis. So he's saying this, don't let, from the outside, the braiding of your hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of clothes, be your adornment. Adornment is just what you think is beautiful, what you think is attractive, what you think is pretty. He said, look, don't let the external things be what you think is pretty. He's not saying that you shouldn't fix your hair. He's not saying that you shouldn't wear makeup and, and jewelry. He's not saying that you can't wear fine clothes. He's not saying that at all. And, and actually, in the Old Testament, we see that, uh, that women did dress nicely, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is something wrong with thinking that that is your beauty. That's not your beauty. And before we go any further, I want you to, to understand and to acknowledge that the reason he is writing this is not because it's a cultural issue, but because it is an issue of the flesh. This is the way everyone naturally thinks. It's not something that we were just... Uh, shaped to think by our uh, by our culture. So this is the way that when we're birthed by our mother, we come out thinking these ways. This is natural. So therefore, we're going to have to change the way that we see it. And you might say, well, I don't really see it that way. Okay, maybe you don't. Probably you do. When you see other people that look in a way that you think is attractive, how does it make you feel? When you look at yourself in a mirror, when you see things in the mirror that you don't think are attractive, how does that make you feel about your identity, your worth, your value? How does that make you feel about yourself? If it makes you feel the way that the Bible thinks, it's, or the Bible says you're probably going to feel, then you're like every other person in the world. And we have to fight this. It's something we have to fight. And, and it, it's not, you know, let's say that, that you have focused your entire life on external beauty. That's okay. But you can turn today. And let's say you've invested, you've even written books on this, and you've taught other people how to do it. It's okay. Right today. Right today. All you have to do is confess it. Just confess it. 
And God is faithful and just to forgive you and forgive you from all un unrighteousness. So it's done, but you just have to convince, have to repent, have to confess that. How often we have to do it? Probably a lot. <laughs> It's one of those ingrained things that we think about a lot, and, and you'll have to keep repenting. You'll, it'll keep coming up. You'll keep feeling that, and you'll just have to keep confessing that that's wrong. Keep calling it uh, truth, calling it script, what script, Scripture calls it, and, and God will give you victory. But, but he says, don't let, don't let, uh, um, don't let your adornment uh, be that of external things, but let it be the hidden, the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable qualities of a gentle and quiet spirit. It says, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable qualities of a gentle and quiet spirit. He says, look, let it be about the things in here, not the things out there and listen what he says about it he says the things in here the imper they're, they're imperishable qualities now that word sounds familiar doesn't it imperishable qualities what does that sound like it sounds a little bit like a passage in in matthew doesn't it doesn't it sound like a passage in matthew 6 20 that talks about treasures doesn't it sound like a passage in Matthew 6 that, that says, don't put your treasures in earthen vessels that, that can will, in earthen things that will corrupt and that will destroy and that, that will fade away, that will rust? Doesn't that seem like earthly beauty if you put your, your value in the way that you look or the way that you dress? Or Isn't that going to fade away? Absolutely. But then doesn't he say that there's something that's imperishable? There's an imperishable treasure here. It says, listen to this, Matthew 6, 20. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where nothing, where, where neither moss nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Imperishable. What are these imperishable treasures that he's talking about? The character of a woman. Allowing your character, allowing the inner part of your person to grow and to be more Christ-like. And as you do that, that is imperishable to God. What's another way of saying imperishable? It's beautiful. It's a treasure that you store away in heaven. That will never be corrupted. Well, what are these treasures that we can invest in in our lives? <clears throat> and, and as I said, this is for women to be submissive to their husband. But this gentle and quiet spirit is something for men as well. It, it, sure, certainly men are to submit. Certainly men are to be gentle. Certainly this is a, this is a you're being elevated as an example of Christ-likeness. But let's get into gentleness first. As, as I realize, gentle and quiet spirit are something that, in other terms, that are misused. And I want, want, want to explain them better, um, that we might understand them. Um, a gentle spirit, uh, truly really translated gentle or meek or, or lowly. Um, there, it's the opposite of harsh, the opposite of self-absorbed and controlling, the opposite of vengeful, and the person that, that has a lot of wrath stored up. It's the opposite of uncontrolled emotions. That's the opposite of gentle. Um, it's not the person that is quiet and doesn't speak his mind because he's afraid. It's not that person. We know that person, and we that person is called meek, that person is called gentle, because out of fear, he just doesn't speak up. Out of fear, he doesn't, he's afraid of the consequences. That is not what we're talking about here. I found a great example of the word gentle, and, and uh, this word for gentle is really only used four times in Scripture, and, and the word, the Greek word is pros. And it's used to describe, think of this, it's used to describe the breaking of a wild horse. 
you, you know the, the imagery of a wild horse as you see them, he's untamed, he's powerful, he's elegant, he, you know, he's, he's able to destroy, he has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, aggression and a lot of temper, and he is the opposite of controlled. And they say this word gentle is used of the breaking or the taming of a wild horse. That's what gentle means. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean a person that uh, doesn't have anything to say or is afraid to speak. It's a person that has something to say. It's a person that is one, you know, has the ability to fight, has the, has the potential to, to do all these things, has all of this power inside of them, but has chosen, listen to this, has chosen for the benefit of the other person to not do that. That is gentleness. That for the benefit of that other person, they have chosen to be gracious. The benefit of the other person, they have chosen to be forgiven. The benefit to forgive them, the benefit of the other person, they have chosen to be kind. All of those things, you, you know, there's there's gracious, forgiveness, kind. I mean, there's the opposite of that. They don't have to do that. You can be mean. You can be vengeful. You, you can uh, do all those things. But a gentle person chooses to build up and not tear down. Chooses, chooses to bring grace and mercy and not anger and wrath. He says, not just gentle, but also a quiet spirit. And quiet spirit is sometimes mis misinterpreted as, as someone uh, who just doesn't speak, you know, that women should be uh, seen and not heard type of thing. That has nothing to do with quietness at all. It's the opposite. Whoever says that is misunderstood this Greek word altogether. Quietness means peace means that they bring peace into the house. When they step into the house, when this person is in the house, they calm the house down. Have you ever been around a person that is just peaceful, that, that, that is calming, that has this power around them, this ability to just bring people to, to a relief and a calm and that everything's going to be okay? And, and that is a godly woman, that she's gentle and that she's calming. And in God's eyes, listen to this, in God's eyes, that's precious. In God's eyes, that's beautiful. You might look at yourself and say, my nose isn't beautiful, my ears aren't beautiful, my eyes aren't beautiful. Understand, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has designed you exactly the way you are. So what you're saying is God's design is bad. Oops. <laughs> God's design is perfect. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're beautiful the way that you are. But true beauty is from the inside. True beauty is treasure. When you choose to submit to God, when you choose to submit to your husband, when you choose to become gentle and quiet, when you choose to, even though you have the ability to stand up for yourself and you could have, but you chose to, to, to allow him to lead and to do the things you needed to make everything better, not worse, make things more godly, you're storing up treasures in heaven. For, your, for, your, for God's glory, you're storing up treasures for heaven. You're living for Christ when you do that. This is, this is suffering for Christ. And Christ is enough. This is keeping your eyes upon Him. And then lastly, as we look at Beauty is seen through submission. We see that also that beauty is found in the heart, in the gentle and quiet spirit. Lastly, we see Sarah's beautiful example. Sarah's beautiful example. Let's finish with this. For in this way, the former in the in, in the former times, the women, the holy women, also hoped in God who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves. 
So he's saying that, look, this is the way it's been from the beginning of time. This isn't something new. You women aren't, aren't uh, having to, to uh, just endure something that's new and, and harsh and all that. You're not being suppressed. You're being uplifted. This is the way that women adorn themselves. This is the way women were shown to be beautiful since the beginning of time by submitting to their husbands. And we're going to get into something. Well, just to, just to go over that for, for uh, real quick, he says, For in this way, the former times, the holy women, so a woman was holy who hoped in God and adorned herself through submission. Okay, that is godliness in God's mind. That you hope in God, and because you're hope in God, because you make him your one bowl to serve him and to love him, that you realize God has made uh, uh, the husband the authority, and therefore you are to um, give him your advice. You are to be involved in decisions, but if he makes a decision that's different than yours, you are to support him 100% joyfully and accept that because God is sovereign and you trust God and not your knucklehead husband. <laughs> but then he goes on in verse 6 and says this, and this might be something that's difficult, but he makes, but it is the point of the one of the points of the passage. Verse six says this: Just as Sarah, so now he's he's talking about the old Old Testament holy women that were example of submission. Sarah is the number one example in Peter's mind. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. Interesting, isn't it? Now, the word in Greek there is kurios, and for us, that's we understand that we call Christ Lord. So it's curious, curious, get it, to wonder why he, she used that and why Peter said that was, uh, that was so significant. Because the word Lord in their culture um, didn't mean Savior. It meant authority. And it was something they used of the person that was in authority over them. So they would use it of their boss, of different people. You're my Lord. You're, my, you're the person in authority over him. So what he was saying is that Sarah was so godly because she called Abraham Lord. Now, that's not the entire context. The context is when she called him Lord. That's what uh, is the issue here. And we go to Genesis uh, chapter 18, verse 12. And when she called him Lord was the time that she laughed at him. Remember that? That when the, the angels and probably a Christophany Christ came and, and, and told them that, uh, that, that they were going to have a child, uh, Abraham looked and said, look, I, I'm old. My wife's old. How is this going to happen? And he, and, and he was trusting God. He went and told her. In verse verses eighteen or chapter eighteen, verse twelve, and this is how Sarah reacted. Sarah laughed to herself, not to him, to herself, self, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure now? My Lord being old also. She was not trusting and not believing in what he was saying. She did not think he was right, and she did not agree with her with his decision, but even in her non-agreement of her decision, she still called him what? Lord. So what is she saying in that? What was the context? So what she was saying is that, look, even though I think you're wrong, I'm going to follow you. God has put you in my authority. I'm going to submit to that. I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to follow behind. Look, that I don't really believe it. I'm not really 100% behind it. But if you believe it, then, then I'm going to change. I'm going to make myself believe it. And I'm going to be 100% behind this because you're my Lord. You're my not my Savior, but you're the person that God is putting over me. And he, she goes on to, and, and Peter goes on to say, that just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, 
if you do what is right without uh, frightening by without being frightened by any fear. So he says, and if you do this, if you submit to your husband without fear, then you are being a child of Sarah. Now, what is he saying? What is he saying there? You're a child of Sarah. Uh, well, you understand that uh, that as believers, we are children of Abraham. Because Abraham is is the uh, is the uh, uh, one that God gave the covenant of salvation to, so so we are um, children of Abraham. So he's saying that look, if you're if you're a believer, you're not just a child of Abraham. If you're a woman and you submit to your husband, you're not just a child of Abraham, but you're a a a, a child of Sarah as well, because that's the way she lived, and you should live that way. But then he gives a caveat in closing. Only if, only if you do what is right without uh, being frightened by any fear. What is he saying? That you submit without fear. It's easy to submit. It's easy to follow. It's easy to do what your husband says because you're afraid of the consequences. He's going to yell at me. He's going to he's going to be mad at me. He's going to be angry. You know. So I'm just going to go with the flow, and that's not submission. Submission is not an exter external obedience uh, to the word. A submission is not just saying, "Oh, okay, fine. That's what you want. I don't really care." No, you care. You should care. You should be involved. But submission is. Is, is saying that, look, I care, I'm involved, but I'm trusting God, not you. So since I trust God, it's okay. Because God has told me to submit, so I'm going to, I'm going to believe that he's going to make all of this right. It's kind of like somebody, like a, a woman wanting to homeschool their kids and a husband wanting to send them to public school. And the woman thinking, wow, if I, if I send my kids to home to public school, they're just going to destroy my kids. And I'm just against that. So I'm not going to let them. I'm going to stand up for that. But God is saying that, look, I've got this. I'm greater than homeschool, and I'm greater than public school. Trust me, not trust the decision. And in trusting God, God would put it all right. God's going to make it all good. And that's what submission means. So in conclusion now, first point that we saw is that beauty is seen through submission. Look, it's a paradigm shift. It's looking at, at the world differently. The world says uh, submission is something that's degrading, it's demeaning, it's putting women down. It's 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 setting them back a hundred years. God is saying the opposite. It is actually elevating you. This is the way I'm supposed to live. I'm supposed to submit my life to God. I'm supposed to submit my life to my authorities. I'm supposed to submit my life to my bosses. I'm supposed to submit my life to basically everyone. That's the way I'm supposed to live. My wife is an example to me. God has put her up as a beacon, as a testimony, as an example, so that I should be like that. Not that she is any less of me, that I might be uh, in charge of her, but that we're equals in Christ, and she allows herself to be placed under me because of her love for Christ. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's special. That shows something. Uh, I mean, that's, a, a, that's communicating the gospel in a way that you can't do with words. That's why he's saying it uh, earlier. We, we said that, look, uh, men are one to Christ by your actions, by your submission, because that is so unique. It is so atypical. It's so against the nature of flesh that when you live your life that way. I mean, it's loving, and you can't love people without submitting to, 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 uh, to control them. I mean, you have to, I mean if, if I want to love someone, I have to be able to say that, look, I'm willing to do whatever it takes of thinking uh, of to, to, to help you, even at the cost of myself. I have to submit myself to you to, in order to love you. And then secondly, Beauty is not just seen through submission. 
But beauty is found in the heart. Beauty is found in the heart. Beauty is not something that we cultivate externally. Beauty is something that is cultivated internally. I pray for you women and men that we see, we communicate, and we let women know and women believe also that their beauty is truly found from within. In, in, and look, the external things are going to decay, right? That's just the way it is. I like that saying that uh, Tamara and I talked about it when we first got married, and, and it did, wasn't originated with us, but let's grow old together. Look, we're, that's the reality. I'm getting older, everybody's getting older, and certainly that's the way it is, but beauty is not the outside decaying body. Beauty is the inside qualities of Christ. It's that gentle and quiet spirit. Gentleness is not somebody who, who is too afraid to speak, but gentleness is somebody who is so loving they know when not to speak. They're so concerned about other people that they, they say words that only build them up, that only encourage. They're so wise with their words. But they never tear down. They never demean. And then when they come into the room, it brings peace. It brings joy. It brings a tranquilness because that's just who they are. They're, they're not in competition with anyone. They're not trying to fight for control. God's in control. They don't need to be. It's okay. As I want to thank you for being a part of this morning's service and part of this passage. This passage has been good for me. I'm not a woman, I'm not having to submit, and, and, and certainly, you know, as a man, we're going to talk about next time, uh, talking about loving our wives, and that's our responsibility. But the thing that really impresses me about this passage is the way I'm supposed to live my life. This is a, a beacon. My wife is set up as a beacon to be an example for me to live my life in submission to others in gentleness, and in quietness. Let's go to the Lord now in a time of prayer. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for these beautiful words. Sorry when, Lord, I'm not able to understand the beauty and the depth of your words as I should, not that I fully grasp it, but thank you for helping me understand it better. I give you the praise and you the adoration. Lord, as we lift up women, as you lift them up, we call them beautiful as you call them beautiful. Lord, I pray that as men and women, we can learn and, and, and truly start to believe that beauty is not external, but beauty is internal. Help us, Father, as we give you the glory and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.